return to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olives, it was near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into, a, into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120, and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, with which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man had purchased a field with the wages of the wage, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language, Alcaldana, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have Accompany us all the time, but the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph of Barsalus, who was serving justice in Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who knows the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lots fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. From the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning at the 20th verse. these words from our Lord. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me that the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated, but the kids like to come forward. <laughs>
teachers would probably tell you, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. There's a right way to practice and a wrong way to practice, right? So if you're practicing all of the wrong bad habits, well then you're not getting, you're not practicing the right way. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. Who plays an instrument? You do, and you do, do you? Yeah, do you play an instrument? What's your instrument? You play a ukulele? Well, that's pretty cool. Okay, maybe I got that wrong. That's pretty cool. Yeah, anybody play a violin? Can I suggest you play it for your parents? Pick it up. They'd love to hear you practice. Well, anyway, so if you're going to get better at your instrument, what do you have to do? Practice it. Yeah. Do you like to practice? Some of you are thinking about it. Yeah. What are some other things that we like to do? We might have to practice. I'm sorry, there's room for you over here. <laughs> this Kyra says sports. You're right. She's right, isn't she? Who goes to practice for sports? Yeah, don't they have practice? Yeah. But there you're practicing probably as a team, right? But if you're really going to excel in your sport, you can't just practice with the team. You have to practice on your own. He's not going to give me one of those, too? <laughs> Look at him in sleep. So, so we, we practice, yeah, we practice our sports. So, you know, who takes, who does anybody play baseball? No. What sports do you play? You play soccer. Or in Europe, they call it football. <laughs> so, do you practice on your own? <coughs> Doing those ball neighbors with your feet, running down, taking shots. Are you supposed to? Yeah. Um, what other sports do you guys play? Tennis. You play tennis. Do you practice tennis on your own? A little? Yeah. Sometimes folks practice tennis and maybe hit the ball against the garage. I don't know. You have places where you can do that. My boys played baseball. And so when they were going to practice, this guy right here, when he would practice, and that one up there, see him, he's up on the, up on the stand. That's what we call a ceiling fan. He's <laughs> a fan. He's up on the ceiling. Okay, and that's horrible. When they play baseball, do you know they would be out there without the coach, without the team, but they would be hitting off of the team and help them be able to see the ball, get the ball, everything. Sports, you have to practice. Can you think of anything else to practice? Sports, what's that? Singing. Singing. We have some singing, y'all are singers, right? Yeah. And so, do you take, any of you take lessons? Some of you do. So do you practice on your own? Yeah. I'm actually a great singer, especially in the shower. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, all of those things, because it just takes time. You know what's really funny? Doctors, they practice medicine. I mean, do they ever get it right? Well, you know what? There's something that we practice as Christians. And I don't know if you ever thought of this before. But you know what? 
I happened to be driving on the eastern shore, and I found this incredible seafood place, and they had a wonderful bumper sticker. And I wanted you to see it. And it says, practice forgiveness. Have you ever thought about that? Do we ever get it right? Practicing forgiveness is just that. But it's so important. Sometimes we don't think about uh, the, the way we go about forgiving. But there are actually ways to go about forgiving that are like strengthening our forgiveness muscles. <clears throat> Did you know you have forgiveness muscles? Yeah. See, because our natural muscles want us to hold grudges and hurt other people when we have hurts inside. But forgiveness means, practicing forgiveness means we build forgiveness muscles. And maybe over the next few weeks we can talk about some of those ways to forgive. And we'll talk about some of those. One of the verses that I like to think of <clears throat> says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I shall repay. Can you say that with me? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Basically what that means is that if we turn our hurts over to God, you know, we can share our hurts with our moms and our dads. But if we turn those hurts over to God, he can deal with them a lot better. So we don't have to think about, ooh, there's that person and they hurt me and I can't wait to get back at them. But it takes muscles. It takes practice. I think so. But we can build those muscles and get stronger and stronger. And that's just the first. We'll talk about some more forgiveness muscles and how to work out those forgiveness muscles. Get them real strong. Yeah. Lord, continue to teach all of us how to forgive, how to practice forgiveness. How to practice it in our homes. How to practice forgiveness in our schools. How to practice forgiveness with those that disagree with us and sometimes hurt our feelings. Lord, it's always easier to want to get somebody back and hurt them like we've been hurt. But help us, Lord, to get strong. Make us good disciples. Don't always do what's easy, but we do what's, what you called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. What's this saying? <clears throat> Practice forgiveness. Keep practicing, and I'll keep practicing too. Look. Here's some un-sugar kind of treats. I think, I'm not sure if they're as good as sweet kind of they're not edible. I know, I know this, but, but they're fun. Denver Summers, and 
brought his family. And we just want to take a second to say welcome. Glad to have you all with us as well today. So I said I was going to talk with you about eavesdropping. <laughs> Probably think of that. Really get after you, right? I'm going to tell you a little story about a guy named David Brenner in Christian history. He was probably one of the most foremost revival preachers um, around the 19th century, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And you can go look, look him up on your own. Brannard just practiced the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Lord and in everything he did and just hundreds of people would gather to hear him preach. You can only imagine all the lives that were changed for generations because of Brannard's ministry. It was, it was said that there wasn't a single person he ever laid hands on that didn't receive a healing. And it's a very, very powerful ministry. And um, one of the folks that followed Brannard decided that he really wanted to get an idea of what his prayer life was like. Because, you know, you would think someone like that has got to have a mighty prayer life. And so he thought, I know what I'm going to do. And so, when Brannard was in prayer, he snuck into Brannard's room and he hid in a wardrobe. If you, you know what a wardrobe is. You know, a big piece of furniture. And, and uh, so he's hiding in there with the suits. And he just wanted to hear what kind of prayer that this man of God had. And of course, Brannard came in and he just began to pray and began to pray. And there was such a power of God that came over during his period of prayer and at length, for such a length of time. The power of God was so thick and so heavy in that room that the gentleman that was hiding in the wardrobe actually came tumbling out. And he went running down the hall and he said, I can't take it. It's too much of God. Can you imagine a story of that kind of power and that kind of authority in prayer where those around you literally say, I can't, I couldn't take it. It was too much of God in that place. What would it be like in our homes when our children and our grandchildren hear our prayers? You realize that they're looking to us. They're looking and they're watching our prayer life. They're looking and they're watching the, the times when we have our Bible out. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about you know, being some holier than thou, you know, beating people over the head with, a, with a, a reference Bible. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that is so legitimate and so authentic. Are you with me, church? Yes. That is so authentic that when you begin to pray, it just begins to usher in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the power of God just, you can think a lot of things, amen? But you cannot think the person in the presence of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes in, and next week we're going to, I can't wait, we're going to talk about Pentecost. But this is a preamble to Pentecost. Because what Jesus has for us today, I believe in the Word, is so important. Because it is a key to Pentecost. It is a key to Pentecost. If we were to eavesdrop 
on Jesus' most important prayer. I believe that it would be John 17. This entire, what's known as Jesus' high priestly prayer. And keep in mind that it's so important. It just can't be missed. That Jesus' prayer at this particular time in his life is right before he goes to the cross. He's already had his time where he's washed the disciples' feet in John 13. But now in John 17, he has this time. I want to know who eavesdropped on Jesus' prayer. Was John the beloved disciple? What was it like? How did he know what Jesus prayed in that time? Did he think for a minute, oh my goodness, this is kind of important, I better write this down, it might be on the test. But he said, but for some reason, he made special note of what Jesus prayed. And I want to look at this, because it's so important. John 17, 20 through 26, and I, we're just going to take it real quickly. Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone. So when Jesus said that, it wasn't just a here and now kind of prayer. He goes on and he says, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So who is Jesus referring to here? I can't believe this. Vincent's crickets. <laughs> who's, who is he going to be praying for? Boy, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I heard more response from people down on a, down on a pier fishing than I get from this <laughs> church this morning.
just moves things along to accomplish purposes and direction. But it's not just unity for unity's sake. Because, yes, all of those things are good. But what Jesus is going to do, he's going to, let's just follow this. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one. And you say this with me, church. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. Okay. So what God, what the Lord is calling us to isn't just to a sake of unity as a group. But he's calling us to tell us that he wants to incorporate us into the very life and the very life activity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to infuse us into that beautiful, beautiful, glorious relationship of love and connection and unity of mind and purpose and heart and soul and everything that goes on. And we have to, when we think of Trinity, we, we gotta stop thinking about that as some sterile doctrinal kind of thing and see it as the love language among Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's what church that he's called us and invited us to be into. And this is the stuff, this is this very stuff that grows churches, but not just grows churches, but takes the church and ignites it and it sets the church on fire into the local community. I'm not sure how else to explain this. And I think you get what I'm saying. I pause for a moment. At one of our get-togethers, I love Hebrews Cafe, how about you? Yes. You know, we, one thing we do well is fellowship. Right? I mean, it's very obvious. When I started here, I was 100 pounds soaking wet with a rock in my sock. Right? This is what Fellowship in Hebrews Cafe will do to you. Okay? It's in Not me. I had no responsibility. Okay? In that. I love the church. But paused after a get together. And I sat down with a family. Mom was in town. I think it was Angie. And I said, and one of the things I heard as we were on the table was, I can't believe this church. This church just has this thing where folks, I don't know, maybe I'm getting this wrong, where folks just kind of have an idea of where we're going. We just jump in and we just make it happen. And maybe I got that wrong, Angie, you can correct me. Please forgive me for mentioning this. But I was like, yeah, that's so cool. I've heard a lot of wonderful compliments about our church. But being recognized for the unity that we have among each other, and it starts with the unity of heart and love for one another. Never ever take that for granted because we enjoy something that a lot of churches don't have a chance to experience. And that's just such a love for one another and a care for each other. And that's an important part of unity. But understand that what Jesus is calling us to is a unity that's ramped up and on steroids. I mean, this is a unity that's bigger than any Red Bull or any other kind of thing. And Chris was like, oh. 
because it's that which is infused with the power and the energy of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If I was to talk about that kind of energy, I don't know that I could do it without talking about nuclear energy. And there you have splitting atoms and the energy that comes off of that. Maybe it would be nuclear energy in reverse. I don't know, but it's that which holds and sustains all things into being. It allows you to pull a chair and be able to sit down on it <laughs> without falling to the ground. The scientist folks are going like, wow, Pastor Dave's a STEM major. No, that's the extent of it right there. <laughs> now, every day I go through with no algebra is another great day in my life. Amen. Amen. And they all amen. said amen on that one, huh? The only thing about being a theology major that was the worst in the world was there's never any good pictures, okay? Be a bio major. It's great. Nursing, lots of good pictures right there. Doctors, good pictures. Theology, history, good, right? I really am that simple. Well, obviously, it's not about me. It's not about the corny jokes or anything else. It's about this whole thing. What if you had a chance to eavesdrop on Jesus' high priestly prayer? If we hear Jesus talk about unity, but even such things as practicing forgiveness, you see, practicing forgiveness has everything to do. Sometimes the church as a whole can be so splintered. The church is a place where we practice forgiveness. We learn more about forgiveness because, you know, I, I've had folks that come up to me and go, Pastor, I want to please pray over me. I want to get my prayer language. I want to learn to pray in tongues. I want to learn... To, you know, I want more of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I want, you know, they want more of God and everything. And I'll say, tell me about your forgiveness question. Tell me about how are you, do you have people that you need to forgive? I'm not letting go of that. Instantly, they go from this, give me, give me, to clench fist. Jesus' high priestly prayer has everything to do with surrender. Mm -hmm. Next week we're going to talk about Pentecost. We can't get to Pentecost without this, that they may be one as we are one. Those disciples in the upper room couldn't get to the day of Pentecost without being all in one, what? Accord. And that's why this prayer that Jesus prays in his time, that holy time with his Father, is so important. And we can't miss it. Because Pentecost, without his presence, without his working that in us, that moves us toward being at one in him and at one with one another, is no Pentecost. We do that right now. If there are folks in our congregation, past, present, or whatever, that have hurt us or grieved us, or maybe it doesn't have to be here at church, maybe it's at work, maybe it's, it's somebody that's really annoying, who knows, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a child, your child, maybe it's somebody in your family. 
And I really believe that he is forgiveness. What God did with that. Even just, you don't have to be there completely just to say, okay, Lord, I surrender to that person. Do you want to see radical revival in a church? Do you want to see radical revival break out in a community? Unity. And it's not just unity and, and agreement on a political level. The church is one of the most divided institutions. And Jesus is saying that they may be one as we are one. Let's just go to the Lord and pray. Lord, you know the grievances and the offenses that keep us from moving on toward unity. Lord, it's so easy for us to sing, I surrender all, and still be holding on to junk. But Lord, in this moment, we surrender. We surrender those into your hands that have offended us or made us feel small, hurt us. We surrender them into your hands. Lord, we don't even haven't even begun to understand the depths of your prayer. Oh Lord, help us. Lord, you 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 prayed this prayer. But you didn't just pray it to the Father. You have prayed this prayer to your church as well. Because our hearts and our minds have something to do with saying yes and answering your prayer. Help us to answer your prayer. We can't do it on our own. We've tried and we failed miserably. Help us to answer your prayer. Lord, you've answered so many of our prayers. So many of our prayers. Help us to be the church that answers your prayers. That eavesdrops on your prayers and says, Holy, yes, I surrender. Not my will, but your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. Praise God. And I understand we have uh, celebrated David Parker's birthday today. Dave turned 19. <laughs> We're glad you get your driver's license soon. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's nice to be together, isn't it, church? Please rise and join me together on page 85 in the Green Book as we recite the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ, be with you all. Awesome. Great, let's share some of that peace.